Hi, I'm John Davidson, lead pastor at Evangel Temple. Thank you so much for tuning into the message today. I hope it's a blessing and an encouragement to you. If it is, leave us a note in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. I hope you enjoy this message from God's Word today. But the passage that we're reading through today is the only miracle that we're going to read about in the Gospels outside of the resurrection of Jesus that's in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it's commonly known as the feeding of the 5,000. So let's jump into it today and read it together. Matthew chapter 14, verse 13 says this, as soon as Jesus heard the news, he left in a boat to a, a remote area to be alone. The news that he had heard about was about the death of his cousin and friend, John the Baptist. But the crowds heard where he was headed and followed on foot from many towns. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. That evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the village and buy food for themselves. But Jesus says, that isn't necessary. You feed them. But we only have five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here, he said. Then he told the people to sit down on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves and two fish. He looked up toward heaven and blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterward the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. About 5,000 men were fed that day in addition to all the women and children. Now, I told you this is a really, really significant passage because it teaches us so much about Jesus. And actually, it teaches us a, a lot of things. And, and I, I want us eventually today to get to something that I think is very important that we often miss reading it from our perspective. Something that I think maybe the people sitting out there in the wilderness that were being fed by Jesus that day, uh, there, there was a message that this miracle probably sent to them that we need to understand as well, but I, I think we probably missed just because we're so far removed from their time and space and location. Uh, but we're gonna, we're gonna get to that. What I wanna do first is talk about three general takeaways from the feeding of the 5,000, three principles, if you will, that we can pull out of this. And if you've been around church a while, you've probably heard some of these before. These probably aren't gonna be really new to you, but three things that we can learn from this passage that we can take away and apply to our lives that are, that are very good, legitimate things that we can learn from Jesus' miracle of taking five loaves and two fish and multiplying it to feed thousands. Now, you heard it say in the passage that there were 5,000 people plus women and children. So we don't know how many people were there, but probably, I don't know, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000. It's hard to know how many people were there. But regardless how many people it was, we do know that it was a, a miracle to be sure that so little food fed so many. The first primary takeaway for me when I read this passage is that we see the natural, but Jesus sees the supernatural. Now, that's a very basic way to understand this, but when, when the disciples are out there with Jesus in the wilderness, and they have thousands and thousands of people who are hungry and need to eat, the disciples want to solve the hunger problem for the people, rightly. And so what they do is, they come up with the best idea they know how to solve it. They say, Jesus, we got to send these people back to the villages so they can find something to eat. I mean, that's the normal thing that, that you would think in a situation like that. But that's a natural way to solve the problem. Jesus was thinking of a supernatural way to solve the problem. And what I love about what God has done for you and me is God has given us a brain with intelligence to solve natural problems. And don't you wish everybody used their brain? It's funny, we always think we're using our brain. We look around at people and we're like, oh man, I wish they'd think a little bit. So, but God has given us a, a brain to solve natural problems, but he's given us a heart with faith for supernatural problems. Because sometimes there are problems that are beyond your ability and my ability to solve. And for those, we can't use our brain, we gotta use our heart. We gotta use the faith that God puts inside of us to realize that even though all we see is the natural solution to problems, Jesus can see the supernatural. He, he sees more than we see. Now, 
That's a, a very simple takeaway from this passage, but I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's almost obvious, maybe too obvious, but it's something that as we read about the feeding of the 5,000, we see that Jesus is, is always seeing more than we see. He sees the supernatural. The second takeaway is this. Jesus, I, we see what we have. Jesus sees beyond what we have, okay? So we see the natural, he sees the supernatural. We see what we have, Jesus sees beyond what we have, okay? So this is another basic takeaway from the feeding of the 5,000. They have five loaves of bread and two fish. Very simple, cut and dried. Five loaves, two fish, seven pieces of food. A lot of times in our life, we come up against a situation where we don't have enough to solve the problem, enough money, enough knowledge, enough whatever. We've got this huge problem in our life. We've got this need, and there's this massive distance between what we have and what we need. And we're thinking, man, can God, can God do anything with this? All I have is this little bit. Can God do anything with this? One of the things that the feeding of the 5,000 teaches us is that Jesus doesn't need a lot in order to do a lot. He can use a little bit. As a matter of fact, in God's economy, if you have a little bit, you have just enough. It's kind of the, the, the wonder and the mystery of the way that God works. If you have a little bit, you have just enough. I mean, think about it. What if the disciples would have come to Jesus and, and when he said, how much do you have? How much food do you have? What if they would have said, well, we've, we've only got three loaves of bread and one fish. Or what if he would have said, how, many, how much food do you have? And they said, Jesus, we only have one loaf of bread. What do you think he would have done? He would have fed the people. <laughs> he, he, he wasn't able to feed thousands of people because of all of the food that they had, the five loaves and two fish. He, he was able to feed the people in spite of the little bit of food they had. So it doesn't matter if there were five loaves and two fish or three fish and one loaf, it wouldn't matter. Jesus knew what he was gonna do. He was gonna feed the people because his heart was compassionate toward the people. And we often look at what we have in our hands when we're up against a problem and we, we say, well, I guess I'll just have to be content with, with less. I, I guess this is all I can have. But Jesus sees beyond what we have. And a lot of times when we're in a situation where we have a big need, we start to do the math between what we have and what we need. Okay, and that's a very normal, natural thing to do. You, you may start to get to the you know, end of the week or the end of the month and realize that you know, you've got more month than money, and you start to try to do the math and say, well, boy, I don't know how I'm gonna pay the bills. There's no way this is gonna work. Friends, when you're up against a problem that's beyond you, let me just give you a piece of advice. Don't do the math. The math won't work. It won't work in your favor. Uh, God doesn't work... Uh, in terms of math, he, again, he works in the supernatural because he sees beyond what you and I have. So the, the right thing for us to do is not to do the math, it's to do our part. And our part is to trust God with what we have, to bring what we have to the Lord and say, God, th I, I wish I had more, but this is all I have. And I, I don't know what you can do with it, but I trust you with it. And what you'll find is you do that over and over and over throughout life is you, you will build a relationship with the Lord that begins to be based on trust and experience as you see him over and over and over again come through and provide for you in, in ways that are miracles. I've seen it in my life. I've, I've, had, I've had times when I've had more month than money and I didn't know how it was gonna work out and I didn't know how I was gonna pay the bills and I was up against medical situations and I didn't know how that was gonna work out and I've seen God come through in miraculous ways, and maybe you have too. And, and it's one of the ways that God demonstrates to us that even though we may have something little in our hands, Jesus sees beyond that, and he knows how to take what we have and do miracles for us. It's, it's one of the great takeaways from the feeding of the 5,000. Um, they had seven pieces of food. Think about that, seven pieces of food for thousands of people. Imagine what the disciples must have been doing, what they must have been thinking. Like they're looking at the food, and Jesus says, use this food to feed the people. And they've got all the food laid out like a little uh, miniature first century charcuterie board. And, and the disciples are like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna have to chop this food up in really small pieces. <laughs> like, we're gonna, they're looking at the crowd, there's thousands of people, and Peter's like, we're gonna need a sharper knife, Jesus, because we're gonna have to cut these things really, really small. Seven pieces of food. But disciples 
of Jesus should always count to eight. Should always count to eight. Because they had seven pieces of food plus Jesus. <laughs> seven pieces of food plus Jesus. You may say, all I got left is $100. Now you got $100 plus Jesus. <laughs> count to eight. Because what you gotta do is, you gotta realize that, that the person that you have in your corner, working in your favor, is he is the X factor. Jesus is the X factor. He, he has this mysterious, miraculous ability to multiply things beyond what you can see or think or understand. So don't get discouraged by the little bit that you have. When you're in a bind and you're in a situation where you don't think you're gonna have enough, remember to count to eight. Seven pieces of food plus Jesus. So number one, a good takeaway from the feeding of 5,000 is that we see the natural, Jesus sees the supernatural. The second would be that we see what we have in our hand, but Jesus sees beyond what we have. And I think another third takeaway from this is that we ask for enough, but Jesus wants to give us more than enough. Now, this is so interesting from the passage that as you read through the feeding of the 5,000 in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, some of the details of the stories change. Like if you, if you set those up side by side and read them together, you'd see some of the details of the story are different. But one detail of the story remains the same throughout. And that is that when, when it all was said and done, when everybody was fed, the disciples walk around and they pick up 12 baskets of leftover food. Now, there's all kinds of... Uh, potential significance to what, what those 12 baskets represented, and, and a lot of people will, you know, pontificate on that, that 12 means this, and the 12 baskets represents these things, but there were 12 disciples, and they're out there serving the people, and it is interesting that when they get done, every single disciple has this huge basket of food left over. And I just kind of think maybe it was Jesus showing off a little bit, you know, like, hey, not only can I take seven little pieces of food and feed thousands of people, but I'm going to do it in such a way where there will be leftovers. There's going to be every disciple who's out there feeding people are all going to have a basket full of food left over. And as you look at the miracles of Jesus throughout the scriptures, you see this kind of leftover mentality. Sometimes we think of leftovers as being bad, but Jesus is always creating leftovers, and God does this in the Old Testament, too, for his people. God is creating more than enough, and this isn't about you and me being rich, and God wants you to prosper, and you know, God wants you to have everything you want. That's not what I'm talking about. What I am saying is that God repeatedly shows himself through his word to his people to be not a God of scarcity, but a God of abundance. He is a God who can do more than we even ask him for. A lot of times we ask God for just enough because, you know, we don't want to be greedy, and so we just ask him for enough. And yet we see repeatedly that God has the ability to do more than enough. Okay, so these are three good, legitimate takeaways as you read the feeding of the 5,000. You can say, we, we see the natural, but Jesus sees the supernatural. We see what we have, but Jesus sees more than we have. And, and we ask for enough, but Jesus has more than enough for us. Those, those would be three very logical takeaways from this passage. But if you stop there, if you stop at those three principles when you read about the feeding of the 5,000, I think you've done yourself a huge disservice. Because I think there's something going on that's way deeper in this passage and I, I think that there's something who are receiving this food from Jesus probably would have thought of that that we need to understand and in order to understand everything this passage has to teach us we need to do what we often need to do to understand things about Jesus which is we need to go to the Old Testament now, a lot of people don't like the Old Testament because they think, oh, it's a lot of stories I don't understand back in there, and it's confusing, and I do pretty good until I get to the book of Numbers and Leviticus, and then things just kind of bog down for me, and it's kind of it's hard to read through. But friends, if we don't understand the God of the Old Testament, if we don't understand who he is and how he works, then we're going to have a really difficult time understanding what the ministry of Jesus means to us and to the world. So I want to take you to two different stories in the, in the Old Testament. The first one is in Exodus chapter 16. Now, to set this story up, you need to know that this story comes on the heels of the deliverance of God's people from slavery in Egypt. So God's people, the, the Israelites, they have been in slavery in Egypt for 400 years. 
I mean, their life has been drudgery. It's been terrible. It's been horrible. And they were in such pain and misery that they cry out to God. And God sends a deliverer to them by the name of Moses to to set the people free. And Moses, if you know the story, you know that he goes up to Pharaoh and he says those famous words, right? Which is, Pharaoh, let my people go, right? Let my people go. I'm leaving here and the people are going with me. And through a series of miraculous events, God delivers the people of Israel out of Egypt and bondage of slavery there. And in order to get from slavery in Egypt to the promised land that God was giving them, they had to cross a desert. And at first, when they come out of Egypt and they walk into the desert, I mean, it's a, it's a legit desert, sandy, hot, difficult, dry place. And at first, they're just glad to be free from slavery in Egypt. But they get a few days into their desert experience, and they start to realize something. And that is that it doesn't do you a whole lot of good to be free from slavery if you die of starvation in the desert. And they've, they're out there in the desert, and they've, they've got the clothes on their back, basically, and the shoes on their feet. Other than that, they've got nothing. They've got no food. They've got no water. They've got no provisions. So they begin to get cranky, as you would and I would, if we were out in the desert with no food and water. And they begin to cry out to God for help, and they say, God, help us. So God hears their cries, and he speaks to them through Moses, their, their deliverer in the desert. And this is what Moses says to the people in Exodus chapter 16, verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, look, I'm going to rain down food from heaven for you. Each day the people can go out and pick up as much food as they need for that day. I'll test them in this to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. Verse 13 says, that evening vast numbers of quail flew in and covered the camp. And the next morning the area around the camp was wet with dew. And when the dew evaporated, a flaky substance as fine as frost blanketed the ground. The Israelites were puzzled when they saw it. What is it? They asked each other. They had no idea what it was. And Moses told them, it is the food the Lord has given you to eat. These are the Lord's instructions. Each household should gather as much as it needs. Verse 19 says, then Moses told them, do not keep any of it until morning. But some of them didn't listen and kept some of it until morning. But by then it was full of maggots and had a terrible smell, and Moses was very angry with them. So God is with his people as they're journeying through the desert, and he provides food for them every single day. Every day they walk out of their tents in the morning, and there's quail, which gives them meat to eat, and there's this other substance that's laying all over the ground. And they don't know what it is. And it's referred to in scripture as manna, which means, what is it? They don't know what it was. What was it? We don't know. But it was food from heaven that God miraculously provided for his people. And that is how God fed his people for 40 years in the desert between the time they left Egypt and the time they entered the promised land, which they called the land flowing with milk and honey, which was their way of saying it would be a fertile land, a place that would provide um, beautifully for everything that they needed. God uses this miracle provision of food for them every single day. And it's interesting what he does here is he doesn't just provide enough for them. He provides more than enough. And we know that because the whole context of the story is that when they would walk out of their tents in the morning, they would see the ground covered with food. And God told them through Moses, only take enough for what you need for your family for today. Now, there's going to be more than than that. There's going to be more than you need, but just take what you need. And it was God's way of helping them to learn day after day that God was going to be faithful, and they didn't have to gather up as much as they could find today. They didn't have to hoard it and be greedy because they could have faith to believe that tomorrow morning when they walked out of their tent, God was going to provide more food. And over time, they learned to have faith and to trust in the Lord that every day, One step at a time, one day at a time, God was going to be there to meet their need. This is how God provided for his people for 40 years in the desert. Now, that story, the story of the people of Israel being delivered from Egypt and how God provided for them every step along the way, all the way to the promised land, this this was the 
overriding narrative of their life for the Jewish people. This, this was the story that they looked back on and that they passed down from generation to generation to generation. I mean, this was like, anybody have, you, you have like a story that your life is built on or may, maybe your life story or like your, something so significant that happened in your life that it just marked you, that you told your kids and grandkids about. This was the story for them. They passed it down from generation to generation about how God delivered them from, from slavery and provided food for them every single day in the desert. Now, fast forward a few hundred years, and you come to another story that I want to share with you. And this is the last one before we'll close. We find this story in 2 Kings chapter 4. This story is about a man named Elisha, who was a prophet of God, a powerful prophet, who, who, who did miracles, and he taught, and he, he, he did great exploits for the Lord. But Elisha finds himself in a situation in Israel where there was a famine in the land. There was no food to be had. Look at what it says in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 42. One day, a man from Baal Shalashah brought the man of God, that's Elisha, a sack of fresh grain and 20 loaves of barley bread made from the first grain of his harvest. Elisha said, give it to the people so they can eat. What, his servant exclaimed, feed a hundred people with only this? But Elisha repeated, give it to the people so they can eat. For this is what the Lord says, Everyone will eat, and there will even be some left over. And when they gave it to the people, there was plenty for all, and some left over, just as the Lord had promised. Isn't that interesting? So we have these stories repeated throughout the scriptures. First, you have the Exodus story where the people are out in the desert, and God miraculously provides food for them every day, more than enough. And then you've got the story from the life of Elisha, where there's a famine in the land, and there's great need, and God brings this guy who has a few loaves of bread and he's able to feed a whole bunch of people and guess what there's even more than enough and, and then in matthew chapter 14 we come to the story of jesus who's out in the wilderness and he's preaching and teaching and all the people are hungry thousands of them and what does jesus do he takes five loaves of bread and two fish and he multiplies it so everybody can have something to eat but not only could they have something to eat there was more than enough. And Jesus isn't just feeding people here, friends. He's making a statement that the people who were gathered around him should have understood because they knew the scriptures. They knew these stories. And when they saw Jesus provide in this way, what they should have said, what they should have thought was, wait a minute, the same God who provided for our people through Moses in the desert, and the same God who used Elisha and multiplied the bread and fed all those people during a famine is the same God who's working through Jesus right here in front of us today to feed all of us miraculously with five loaves of bread and two fish. That's what they should have understood. Now, some of them probably got that and some of them didn't, but that's what they should have understood. And that's the, the point I think that you and I often miss when we read through this is that Jesus was making a statement about who he is. They should have seen this miracle of Jesus and understood, oh, Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's the, the Savior, the Deliverer that we've been waiting for. The ones that our parents told us about would come and save us. That, that, the, the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 should have tipped them off to that. Now, what we often do with stories like this in Scripture is we try to personalize them. And we read a story like the feeding of the 5,000 and we think, oh man, Jesus can provide for our needs. Isn't that awesome? He wants to give us everything that we want. Isn't that great? And we take all kinds of personalized principles to it, which is really kind of a greedy way to think about this passage because a lot of times what we do is we, we read ourselves into scripture, which by the way, we should do. We should read ourselves into these stories, but a lot of times we read ourselves into the wrong place in the story. And we make the story about us. We make ourselves the center of the story. But friends, whenever we read this book, we have to remember that God is the center of the story. Every story in here, God is the center of it. So every time we read an account in scripture of anything, we should always be asking the question, what does this teach us about God? What does it teach us about the Lord that we serve? What does it teach us about our Savior and who we are in relationship to him? And what we find as we read this story of the feeding of the 5,000 is that the beauty of what Jesus does there 
in that wilderness with those people when he breaks the bread and he blesses it and he gives it to them all, the, the beauty of it isn't just that he fed a few people. When you put it in the context of all of the other stories in Scripture, here's what we see, the, 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 the picture that we see taking shape. God throughout the ages, and this is so important, God throughout the ages in the Old Testament and then in the New Testament in the life of Jesus repeatedly shows himself as the great banquet host who invites his people to the table. From the very first pages of Genesis when he puts Adam and Eve in the garden and he says, I've given you all this food to eat. You can eat of any tree in the garden except this one, but everything else you can have, it's all yours. He provides for his people more than enough in the wilderness. He provides through the prophet Elisha more than enough for the people during a famine. When he feeds the 5,000, there's more than enough so that there's 12 basketfuls of food left over. And we see this theme as the great banquet host inviting his people to the table play out all the way right to the end of the scripture and we get to revelation chapter 19 and we see what happens in the new heavens and the new earth and this is what it says then i heard again what sounded like the shout of a vast crowd or the roar of a mighty ocean waves or the crash of loud thunder praise the lord for the lord our god almighty reigns let us be glad and rejoice and let us give honor to him, for the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and the bride has prepared herself. These are in the last couple of pages of Scripture, and we see this description of Jesus, once again, the Lamb, who invites the bride, that's us, his church, to the banquet table one more time. And this time, it's for all time. It's for all eternity. And he says, come to the table. I've got more than you need. I've got enough for you. I'm gonna provide for you forever. And so isn't that wonderful? Isn't that beautiful? But here's the, here's the even better thing, is that the table that God is constantly inviting his people to isn't really about food. Food is just kind of the, the setup for it that we see happen throughout scripture as God is providing for the basic needs of his people. Really what's happening is that the table is all about relationship. The table isn't about food. food. Yeah, we do food at the table, but think about when you bring your family to your table for a, a holiday meal. What's it about? Is it about the food? Oh, sure, we love the food, but it's about relationship. You go around the world outside of the United States. And a lot of times what you find is you, you, you see that they have a greater appreciation for this than we do sometimes. Hospitality, fellowship, bringing people into their home. And, and when they invite you to their table, it's not just because they want to feed you and give you enough food to eat. When they bring you to the table, they're saying, we want relationship. We want to know you. This is what God, the great banquet host, does all throughout history. He invites his people to relationship. And yes, part of the relationship is salvation. That's a huge part of the relationship. The fact that Jesus would give his life for ours, for the forgiveness of our sins, save our souls from eternal punishment and death, that's a huge part of the relationship that we have with him. But another part of the relationship that we have when we come to the table of the Lord is we have provision for everything that we need. Just like God has provided manna in the wilderness and just like he broke the bread and fish and multiplied them for people who had need, it is true that God cares about the needs that you have. And I just think it's awesome that the God of the universe, who's all powerful, has all authority, can do anything he wants, stoops down to meet us at the point of our most basic needs like food like finances like issues in our relationships wisdom for our life help us with things going on at work God cares about these things so the wrong way to interpret the feeding of 5,000 would be to say well praise God he just 
wants to give me everything I want. I got a God who just gives me everything, you know, gives me more than enough. The right way to interpret the feeding of the 5,000 is to say, wow, I serve a God that is so awesome and he loves me so much that he wants relationship with me. He wants me at his table. And then once I'm at his table, he doesn't just want to love me. He doesn't just want to eat with me. He wants to provide for me. He wants to take care of my needs. He wants to prove to me over and over and over again that the stuff that's important to me is important to him. And there may be some of you today that are in a situation like that where, where you just need to know today that God cares about the stuff going on in your life. You may have some real needs that you're praying about, some things that you're like, I don't know how this is gonna work out. Maybe you're up against a situation at work or at home. Maybe in your finances or your health. You're like, I just, the math doesn't work out. I, I don't know how it's gonna work. Friends, we serve a God who is able, he's capable of doing so much more than you and I can imagine. And he wants to do that for us, not because we're the center of the story and we're so awesome, but because he's so awesome. He loves you. He loves you. Thanks again for watching the service today. I hope it was an encouragement to you. We'd love to hear from you. So if you'd like to leave a note in the comments and let us know what you thought about the message, we'd love that. And if you're ever in the Springfield, Missouri area on a Sunday morning, we'd love to have you join us for church. You can attend our 8 a.m. classic service or you can join us for church at 9.30 or 11.